If Narnia and the Twilight Zone had a one-night stand with enough hallucinogens to make the castle Euphoria flinch, you'd get this island. What happens when you combine snow-seasoned beaches, sky-molesting reaches, air so clean you'd swear it bleaches, a hippie satanist wet dream jungle, and animals not even Dr. Seuss on Adderall could come up with? You'd get a place with enough worlds for a Mario side-scroller, all packed into an island the size of West Virginia. Tasmania is like the lesser-known DLC spin-off of Australia. It was originally connected to Australia as part of a polyamorous land situation known as Gondwana, until they divorced and Tasmania moved out on its own. But not without attachment issues, since it's only about 150 miles off the mainland. It's fitting you can't spell Taz without mania, because one day in Australia's draft folder will have you seriously reevaluating your sanity. Everything's just backwards. The seasons are flipped with summer being December to late February and winter being June to September. And if you want to fall without tripping, you'll have to March 1st. And because of the rain shadow effect in the many mountains of Tasmania, the west half of the island gets five times the rain the east does, making the landscape more bipolar than the animal it's known for. Speak of the devil, we'll get to them. And that wombat is definitely not sleeping. But that's exactly the kind of mind to expect from a land where the toilets flush backwards. In fact, we can start right there. Your introduction to how weird Tasmania can get starts the day you lay cheek on a seat without checking. That's an easy way to get your tent tickled by a frog in your toilet. It happens so often that it's one of the things Australians just accept as a fact of life. It's like a fairy tale frog trying to be a prince but got confused and went for the wrong lips, but it honestly could be worse. Just think about being the frog. Imagine thinking you're at a water park but then looking up to an asshole dropping bombs like it's Hiroshima. And while getting your bathing suit area caressed by Kermit would surely put a dent in your mental, the frog's technically not dangerous and definitely not the worst thing you can find in your bathroom. Imagine dropping Chow in the dunny just to see the highly venomous Tasmanian tiger snake just under some TP. And yes, that's actually happened. How about a family of also venomous jack jumper ants in your kitchen? Now, their sting is a jihad to wasp, but only mildly painful in humans, unless you're allergic, in which case they'll tattoo your name on a headstone. It's like I always say, the odds might be low, but they're not zero. In Tasmania, you can have frogs causing clogs, but how about a disaster in your plaster? Do me a favor real quick, close your eyes. Go ahead, do it. Now imagine after a long, stressful day on your feet, you finally get into bed, nestle yourself under the covers, the room is the perfect temperature, it's nice and dark, and slowly drift off into that familiar, inviting world of s Congrats, you've just had the experience every Australian has at one point. The day you find out your roommate's with a brush tail possum, the devil's squishmallow. Their personality trait involves breaking into houses and living there rent free, all while serving the soundtrack of Satan getting his prostate punched. And they're a protected species, so they're above the law, which is how they end up in Looney Tunes levels of nonsense. There was one time a brush tail broke into and trashed some woman's office, but in his defense, he's sorry. This possum broke into a bakery, and I guarantee you sorry is the last thing, well, other than half-digested pastries, coming out of his mouth. In their defense, they are cute, and their vision might be poor, but they'll still peek at you. They're living proof that out of fight or spite, life in Tasmania will find a way. Take these rocks for example. The rocks, called dolerite, were formed by magma getting pushed up through the crust, kind of like a pimple that can extend up to 300 meters above the sea, or just under a thousand feet. You might think nothing could get any use out of Earth's acne, but it's actually a popular rest stop for fur seals, where they can take a break from hunting without also getting packed into a lunchbox by a great white. There's about 50 of these seal service areas across the island, with over 2,000 seals taking advantage, and if you look further out, you'll see they're not the only ones. Humpback whales will travel from their freezing feeding grounds to warmer waters to have calves, and back again, and we used to think they just fasted the entire time for six months. But it turns out, humpbacks will use the waters off Tasmania, like truckers at a diner, as a place to refuel on the way home. The sights don't end once you get on the beach either. If you're lucky, you might catch a leatherback freight train of a turtle heading back to sea. If you're a little less lucky, you'll run into a leopard seal that thought it was too good for directions. You know, it's not until you see these things on land that you realize just how bad penguins got it. It's rare, but every once in a while the rubber assault sub wanders from Antarctica and ends up in Australia's understudy. You might think they're cute, but let me remind you, they have a confirmed human body count. Besides, there's another seal I think you'd rock with even more. This is Neil, Neil the Seal, for real. He's a southern elephant seal that's honestly been bullying the small town of Dunalley and everyone just accepts it. Cause Neil is the law and the landlord. Elephant seals are notorious for their intrinsic disdain for human infrastructure. Neil is no different. 
As far as he's concerned, it's his town. Y'all just renting it. All that adds up to a plus size pinniped with an attitude problem. An attitude everyone just puts up with because isn't that just the most Australian f***ing thing you could do? And apparently Neil's still out here being a menace, so if you live in Tasmania, you might just get a visit Neil. from him. Just make sure you have a sick day in the chamber in case a 1300 pound sausage decides to park in front of your car. And because, Tasmania, you can go from a diet job of the hut on your lawn to the world's smallest penguin. Fairy penguins spend most of their time at sea, but once a year they'll return to land to shack up, get a nice burrow, and eventually start a family. The penguin dream. It's adorable until they choose to shack up under your house and you find out what a pint-sized penguin vow renewal sounds like. I owe you an apology. But since Australia is nothing but a compromise with nature, they get the same diplomatic immunity as Neil. There's even places where you can watch hordes of travel-sized blue penguins coming home after a long day at sea. And if you're really lucky, you'll see what happens when he comes home to his wife getting her plumbing fixed by someone else. Pro tip though, they don't like bright lights, but they're chill around red. I, I don't really know why, but them's the rules. Speaking of rules, you've probably heard of island gigantism, where animals become the supersized version of themselves if they've been marooned long enough. Tasmania is no exception, the difference is it led to the biggest tree in the world. This is Eucalyptus regnans. It's one of the few trees with a pyro king, since they can only reproduce by releasing seeds from pods after they've caught on fire. But because of the rain shadow effect and one side of the island getting way more rain than the other, it also means way less fires. So they kinda just keep growing. Not only can they grow taller than the Statue of Liberty at over 300 feet, many of these trees are well over hundreds of years old since that was the last big fire. Some of the oldest can be 500. That's half a millennium of waiting to spread their seed. Talk about getting pushed to the edge. That's how you get these prehistoric, almost alien looking Jurassic playgrounds dominating the western half of Tasmania. These not only make it one of the biggest temperate rainforests in the world, but Tasmania is one of the few places on earth with a negative carbon footprint. And I believe it, just looking at this I could tell that O2 hit different. But also don't forget, the same island that's just over 150 miles from Australia is also a little over 1500 miles from the frostbitten loins of the land, Antarctica. So technically it should be no surprise they can also get a good amount of snow even at the beaches. And maybe it's just me, y'all can let me know, but I had no idea kangaroos could be around the concept of snow. I did not think that was something they had to deal with. But yeah, the forests of Tasmania are definitely something out of a fever dream. Stevie Wonder could walk through it and see that. Mostly because you don't even need to see, the soundtrack of the Apple Isle is trippy enough. Like the kookaburra, the bird who carried the careers of sound engineers by being the stock voice of the jungle. And if you've ever watched Flipper or that one time Spongebob tested the FCC, both of those were just a sped up cracked out call of the Kookaburra. Also they're not even native to Tasmania, but were brought in to violate snakes. So were lyrebirds, except they were brought in for their own good. And lyrebirds are able to mimic anything around them, and not just other birds. There was a lyrebird named Chook who lived in the Adelaide Zoo while a new exhibit was being built. So guess what he did? <laughs> and here you have a lyrebird imitating a child. And while cosplaying as a chainsaw is cool, the gaslight potential is too outrageous to not be acknowledged. There's other birds too. You probably know this as a carnage happy hell Tweety and a literal black air force. But Tasmanian magpies don't swoop and neither I nor science have any idea why. Also I don't know what I thought a goth canary sounded like, but it certainly wasn't this. I'm as confused as you. If you look up into the trees, you might find the eye-catching Tasmanian rosella, or the tawny frogmouth, which is... Quite literally the opposite, truly a Muppet of a bird, but it's the Muppet Tasmania deserves. And then you have the Nightjar. A little known fact about them is they actually have an even smaller Siamese twin of a bird right by where their beak's supposed to be. And now you'll never be able to unsee it. But that's not even close to the weirdest animal in Tasmania. That would have to be, yep, we've entered the platypus portion of the video. It will take a whole nother video to describe all the ways this identity crisis is a middle finger to the natural order, so here are some highlights. They have no nipples, so they sweat milk. They have no teeth, so they chew with rocks. They have no stomach, it goes straight down their gullet. 
They swim blind and deaf and use electrical impulses like sharks to find prey because of course they do. And they have one all-purpose hole that was apparently so fascinating their entire family reunion got named after it. The only animal in their league of eccentricity, yeah weird was just too bland a word for them, is the echidna. It's also a stomachless, egg-laying, milk-sweating, water-loving monotreme. They're a lot like the Greek guard dog Cerberus, but instead of three heads, they have four. Instead of on their shoulder, theirs is south of the border. Echidnas have a fire hydrant with four nozzles, and only two can come to a conclusion at a time. Speaking of erupting heads, I'm really about to blow your mind. So you probably know the Disney show Phineas and Ferb, with character Perry the Platypus, created by Dan Povenmeyer, who came up with a concept for a teal tinted monotreme in 1993. And obviously platypes aren't green in nature, or at least not the live ones. Except in late 2020, scientists discovered the walking custard factory glows under UV light. Take a wild guess what color. Yeah. Yeah, this goes right at the top. Their quadrupine cousins glow too. In fact, we found out that a lot, if not most, Australian mammals show out under ultraviolet. And yeah, if anyone has a reason other than that's just Australia, I would love to hear it. And if you thought it couldn't get weirder, one, you're not giving Tasmania nearly enough credit, and two, there's an animal here that catches bodies and uses light to do it. This underground light show is a cave full of glowworms. They're not worms, but the larvae of a type of gnat that uses bioluminescence to lure insects in and a thread hanging from the cave ceiling to trap them, straight out of the page of the anglerfish playbook. Once a victim flies too close to the sun, the larva pulls them up to revoke their existence. Sea sparkles are a lot less dramatic, and these are caused by bioluminescent plankton that, like sketchers, light up when disturbed. I actually went to a bioluminescent bay in the Cayman Islands, and even though it means swimming in a microscopic mosh pit, it's definitely a trippy ride everyone should experience at least once. But it has nothing on Aurora Australis. Now I could give you the scientific explanation that the lights come from charged particles from the sun hitting atoms in the atmosphere, getting them more riled up than a fan getting an athlete's sweat sleeve, and releasing energy in the form of light. But it's honestly easier to say of course an island stoned off its gourd would have a sky on shrooms. Which is actually close to the other thing Tasmania is famous for. Tasmania is the world's leading producer of the building blocks for opiates and supplies half of Earth's ingredients for morphine, fentanyl, and everything else in the average episode of Euphoria. In 2009, mysterious crop circles appearing in fields had farmers all forms of befuddled, until they realized it was just wallabies downing poppy plants, getting more cooked than the Alps of Sweeney Todd, and hopping around in circles until eventually passing out. There were respected members of the scientific community that said it was aliens, the whole time it was an economy sized kangaroo eating enough product to have Horton hearing a who, what, and a how. Cockatoos get lit off it too, but at least with them they're only feeding after the seeds and not just getting higher than their wings can take them. But wallabies walling out is a problem for one very crucial reason. Tasmania is also the roadkill capital of the world. It's said that 32 auto-assisted census subtractions occur every hour. And since wombats are walking cinder blocks with a rear end of retribution, they have the potential to drive a literal wedge between your car and the road. Leading the world in furry four-wheeled flatlines is bad for them, but great for one animal. This wombat's in a nightmare, but he's not dreaming, cause Tasmanian devils will live up to their name by feeding on carcasses from the inside out, to the point where they'll have a food coma while bowels deep in the dead and decaying. And at the size of a small dog, devils have the most damaging bite relative to body size of any mammal. Clearly brush tails took voice coaching from them, since they literally got their name from settlers touching down on Tasmania and hearing what a devil dinner party sounds like. But they're pretty well known, unlike their close cousin the quoll. I don't know how they fly under the radar because where devils are mostly scavengers, quolls mostly eat what they kill. And considering there have been over 100 cases of quolls feeding on human remains, 111 to be exact, that devil title looking real fraudulent. Quolls also have an alternate black morph, proving that any animal with an Oreo colorway lives on demon timing. The Tasmanian devil's biggest op is their own kind. They're so bite happy that it's a big reason for the spread of devil facial tumor disease. And considering biting's basically foreplay to them, it's like an STD that's done an absolute number on their population, and there's a real fear it can cause them to go the way of the thylacine. The thylacine's been called the Tasmanian tiger or the Tasmanian wolf, but it's actually the other dominant predatory marsupial and one of the few times an animal got gaslit into extinction. Bounties were put on their heads, and not only were people saying thylacines were marking 50,000 sheep a year in a place that didn't have more than 40k max, later evidence says that their jaws might have been too weak to even murk a sheep. To be fair, if that's true, nature set them up. And in 1936, the last known thylacine named Benjamin died in the Hobart Zoo, almost fittingly enough after being locked out of his sleeping area and the bipolar Tasman weather finished him off. But from everything we've learned about Tasmania, you knew they weren't gonna let that slide. Since 2005, devil diehards have been creating insurance populations of those without the disease and even established an inaugural class of imps on the nearby Maria Island. 
There have also been efforts to create a vaccine to save the mascot of Tazzy, and as of 2023, it's officially been approved for testing. And after a 3,000 year devil absence, Tasmanian devils were born on the Australian mainland after 44 of them were drafted in 2011 to a breeding program for the Aussie Art Devil Project, which definitely sounds like a cult. You even got dogs working as wingmen for the devils by smelling when a female's ready to mate, date, and procreate so they can get her set up with a male. Since then, about 500 joeys have joined the devil database and they might not be the only ones making a comeback. There's a good number of people that believe that the thylacine is still out there, and with a lot of the Tasman wilderness being straight up inaccessible to most people, maybe the tiger of Tasmania is still out there in the shadows. And honestly, staying low key is probably their best move. But that's really Tasmania as a whole. How such a medley of mind fuckery and generational balderdash can be so underrated is beyond me. But if I've learned anything about Tasmanians, that's exactly how they want it. But that's gonna do it for this video that was actually inspired by this animation by Felix Colgrave. I'm not gonna spoil too much, but it basically shows you what a day in the Tasman wilderness might look like. I'm gonna put a link in the description. Definitely go check that out. Friendly reminder that I am selling calendars. Link will also be down below. Drink water, hug your parents. If you see a thylacine for their own good, no you didn't. And I'm gonna see y'all in the next one. Devil's got my pack of lint. Got my lint. Does he ever got my lint? Seventy eight percent, you mongrel.